Stuart Blackwell Teaching Hospitals. This uh, meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being recorded. I will be your host for the afternoon and I'm very much a part-time R user, so very much delighted to introduce someone who very much isn't. Uh, senior Fellow of the Editors R Community and long-standing stalwart, Dr Chris Maney. Why, thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a great introduction. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Um, <laughs> Stuart is not only is hosting, but he's also going to um, jump on and off of the chat and uh, shout out if you've got any questions um, and just help draw my attention to them as I, I struggle a little bit to uh, keep tabs on everything that's going on on these online sessions. But uh, yes, so welcome. Welcome to the session today. The session is being recorded. So if you prefer not to be on the recording, please be aware of that just so um, you can keep your cameras off and such. Um, if you're happy to be on the recording, please feel free to, to ask questions as we go. Uh, turn your camera on if you can, so we can see you. It's always always fun. It's a little little easier to to answer just psychologically if I could see who I'm talking to. Um, what we're going to talk about today is obviously regression modelling. That's what you've signed up for. Um, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But from a practicalities perspective, there's a few things to share. Um, hopefully, you can all see um, in the chat. Uh, oh, I think. Did I send them to everyone? I don't think I did. I've sent them to just the NHSR team. Let me send them to everyone. So I'm going to send some links to things here. So firstly, all the code for today is available on GitHub. Um, I'm using our markdown slides uh, created with a package called Sharingan, uh, which is my terrible pronunciation. Um, but all the code is there. So all of the charts and such that you see embedded uh, in the presentation and the presentation itself uh, is all available in that repository, as well as the exercises for today. So uh, the exercises that I'll ask you to pick up are the ones that are in the root of the directory, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute and explain. Um, but uh, the, the solutions to the exercises are also included as well, but they're put into a folder called solutions. Uh, so if you want to have a go at them without seeing the solutions, I would recommend that first of all. Uh, but equally, if you prefer to just work through the solutions or to check your work against the solutions, you've got them there uh, in the solutions folder. Um, the slides, as I said, uh, they are markdown slides and they are published online. So I'll put them up on the screen in a minute. Uh, but if you prefer your own copy, um, you can click on the link here and you can have them running in a side window as well. Uh, and if you want that as a reference to go back and forth, uh, that might help you out. There is also an RStudio Cloud workspace. So for those of you who prefer to work in RStudio Cloud, um, that might be helpful if you either haven't got R on your machine or um, you uh, are not comfortable pulling the material down from GitHub. But I'll, uh, I'll show you how to do that in a second. Uh, you can click there and go and join the workspace. And it'll generate um, uh, an R Studio um, window within your uh, within your main web browser window. So let me share my screen and show you some of those things. Okay, so let me just adjust my screens slightly. There we go. Hopefully, right now you should have my slides. Okay, so what I will also show you first of all then is the GitHub repository. So GitHub is a source control um, it's a kind of repository software. Uh, for those of you who might have used it before, um, I'm sure you'll be quite comfortable with this, but uh, many of us haven't. So what this is, is it um, is like a hosting site for publishing your code to um, where it comes into its own is collaboration across code. So different users from different places um, can use the code and contribute to it. Uh, it's also a very good medium for just publishing your code. So um, the link that I dropped into the chat is just here, but if you were to go to that, it would take you to this here. Uh, and this is a GitHub repository. Um, so as you just scan down, you can see the files. Uh, we can see the files there that are in this repository. There's a little bit of an explanation as to what it is there. This has been run a few times now. So as you can see, I'm a little bit out of date there. I forgot to update that date. Um, there's also a link here. If you click on that link, that takes you out to the slides I mentioned a second ago. So these are online version of the slides and you can scroll through them at your leisure. Um, but I will go through them on the screen as I talk in a second. Now, how do you get this code so you've got it so you can run yourself? So 
you've got a couple of options. If you're au fait with using Git and GitHub, what you want to do is clone this repository. So that means to take a copy of it, pull it down. So if you have Git installed on your machine and you know what I'm talking about, you can click on this code button here, copy the URL, uh, and then you can clone it into RStudio. So this is my local RStudio, but what that would be would be creating a new project here. And what you want to do is select the option for source control. When my computer decides to do it, it's a little bit slow. Please forgive me. Yes, yeah, so you would click sorry, the version control, Git, and then you could paste the URL in and click create project, and it will pull down and open that project for you. If you're not a Git user or you're not so happy with that, um, you've got another alternative here. You can click the download zip button here and that will do exactly what it says on the tin and that it will download this RStudio project as a zip file and you can click on that and open that up um, and then open the RStudio project file. Um, so let me just show you there. So that's downloaded here. So then you've got all the code on your machine uh, and you could open the RStudio project and it would open then in your local version of RStudio. So if you prefer to use the cloud version, though, uh, we do have a workspace set up on our Studio Cloud. Um, so there is a link again in the chat. So I'm just going to go into my version here. Um, I see we've got a few people have fired it up there. As you launch this project, um, so if you follow the link and launch the project, it will give you your own uh, copy of it. It will probably flash up some red text here, which forgive me, I can't remember exactly what it says. It might say temporary copy or something like that. Uh, because it's a copy of, of my workspace. There is an option for you to then save it, which saves your own local copy. But once you load it up, what you can see here is a, quite a busy window, but this is our studio within your web browser. And to give you a bit more space to work, I would firstly close this. So I click on this button here personally, which takes it off to the side. And generally when you're working in web browsers based on Chrome, if you press F11, it makes it go full screen. So then you're, you've got the most space to work in it. And then F11 again, it'll bring it back down. So that's just to give you a little bit more scope. So you don't need to uh, be going through this constantly throughout the tutorial. We're going to go through a number of slides and explain some of the concepts behind regression uh, modeling and, and what we might want to do. And then we're going to step through um, four kind of specific exercises. And we've got a final exercise five, where you can have a go at building the best model you're able to on a data set. So as I said before, the uh, exercises are in the main directory, but if you want to pick up the solutions to them, there's a solutions folder here, which if you were to click on that, for some reason our Studio Cloud is wearing around. My project went to sleep because I haven't used it. Um, but if you go into the solutions folder, there are obviously the solutions to the exercise. Okay, doke. So without further ado, do shove uh, questions into the chat. Um, uh, and my colleague Stuart will shout out um, as we go uh, if there's anything um, that needs answering right away. Um, otherwise, during the, um, sorry, I'm trying to get around this share bar to actually find the thing that I need to click on on the top of my screen. Um, yeah, so do, do ask your questions and we'll answer them as we go. Oh, come on, Zoom. I've got a really annoying uh, bar at the top, which is the share screen bar, which I can't seem to get rid of currently. Right, okay, so what I will run through. So um, as Stuart said, um, my name is Chris Maney. Um, I'm Deputy Director of Specialist Analytics at North Central London ICB. Um, I have a background in building a lot of regression-based stuff, essentially on HES data, building national um, risk adjustment models. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have um, my PhD research work funded on how we could use these sort of models in a variety of different places for patient safety data. So um, I've gone through much of the pain of learning to do these things for you uh, in terms of how to apply regression models in R. And hopefully I can distill um, some of my painful few years of wondering if I was wrong constantly or my data was wrong or if there was something else I wasn't unaware of, hopefully I could distill that into something that you can take away. 
So what we're going to go through is we'll briefly touch on correlation because I know a lot of people tend to, to start with correlation analyses because it's a, you know it's a reasonable starter. Uh, I hopefully I can convince you that linear regression. If you're going to do a correlation, you might as well do a linear regression, and it's got a lot more information there. We'll look about how to build a linear regression model, how we look at the output of it, how we interpret that output, uh, and then assess whether or not it was a, a, a terrible, an okay, or a brilliant model. We'll look at moving beyond just one predictive variable into several and how you then uh, change your interpretation of different bits. Um, we're going to look at how you use a regression model. So once you've fitted a regression model, what that's basically done is create a formula. So you can use that formula then to predict onto new data. So that's the basis of predictive modeling that you'll see in machine learning, AI, statistics, whatever else, is that you fitted a model and you're then applying that model to a new data set to predict into the future. And we'll also look at, um, I guess, this, this, the next stage on from, from the simpler linear model into the so-called generalized linear model that you can use in a lot more context. So uh, there's, there's, I'll make no apologies for mixing theory and examples because I think you need enough theory, um, but I personally find just theory very difficult. So hopefully my examples will help you today. So what are we talking about? So really we're talking about whether we can somehow quantify the relationship between a couple of variables, um, often more, but we'll start with two. So we're usually trying to say that things are either uh, related or they're not related. We're also often trying to look at the strength of the association. And the two techniques that often get used for this um, are correlation, as I was saying before, um, Correlation is a, is a simpler way of doing it, and there are different types of correlation coefficients you can use, but broadly it quantifies the strength of the relationship and it tells you what sort of direction that relationship's in. Direction will make a lot more sense when we look at some plots in a second. And then there is um, regression, which is the main focus for today. Um, regression sort of is a little more formal in the sense that it, it's estimating how much an outcome variable changes in relation to one or more um, predictor or explanatory variables. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of different names. So often if you read regression textbooks, you get a whole bunch of confusing names. Generally, we're talking about why, and we're predicting why. Why is a variable we're interested in? And that could be called all sorts of things are dependent. It can be called the outcome. Um, but what we're talking about, that's the variable of interest. We're trying to work out how to predict that variable. Uh, there's also X, uh, or it could be many Xs depending on how many different predictors you have in your model. And they're often referred to then as the predictors or the independent variables or explanatory variables. So we're using X or many X's to predict or explain Y. We have to be a little bit careful because sometimes the uh, effects uh, can mask each other, change each other, alter each other's effects in, in the, each other's presence. Um, this is not going to be a session on the many pitfalls of confounding and for those of you who are really interested in that I can really really recommend the Leeds Causal School and Causal uh, Inference who really go in, go to town on understanding this sort of thing um, but it's important for you to recognize that um, simply including one variable might not be the whole story of understanding whether or not something is causal and it certainly uh, sorry certainly won't be causal necessarily but it might be confounding, it might have been altered. Um, you may hear the adage of like correlation doesn't equal causation, um, which I'd say is fair. Um, I think you have to do a lot more philosophical work behind things to understand whether things are causal. So what are we talking about? So I was talking about Y a second ago. So we put Y, we tend to put Y on this uh, vertical axis here, and we tend to put X. Uh, on this horizontal axis here. So what we're going to try and do is use X to predict Y. So that's looking at these data points here, you'd probably say this kind of looks like as X increases, Y increases. And you know, it's sort of scattered around a little bit, but broadly it looks like a fairly tight bunch going in one direction. So let's apply some correlation to it. So what we're going to use is the, probably the most common measure, which is the Pearson correlation coefficient. And again, I won't go into the, the maths of it particularly, but um, what it is, is it's a score that ranges from minus one to one. Um, and the minus one extreme is a perfect negative correlation, 
and the one is a perfect positive correlation, which will make more sense again in a second when you see it visually. Uh, and importantly, if you get a zero, that's suggesting that there's no correlation. So here's um, a graphic taken from Wikipedia. So if you take the top line here, we've got one. So this is a perfect positive correlation. So as X increases, Y increases. So you can see it starts to go down as the points are a little bit more scattered. We've got a point 0.8 here, a point 0.4. We've got a zero here, which sort of importantly is, is pretty much a cloud of points that doesn't have one distinct direction. We've got the minus 0.4, which you can see that uh, as X increases, Y decreases. Similarly, all the way up to the minus one. So it's important to note as well that that can go, um, it, it doesn't actually have to go uh, completely sort of 45 degrees. So they can be perfectly positively correlated, yet depending on the scales and the direction, it won't it will it will look like a straight line rather than looking like a straight line at 45 degrees if that makes sense uh, but there's a sort of note of caution here um, as with anything that's related to averages if you have points above and below a line you can find that they average out in the middle to zero so it would be unwise to say any of these shapes at the bottom here don't have a distinct pattern to them they certainly do but they have a zero uh, Pearson correlation coefficient because the correlation coefficient is looking for that straight line relationship. So how do you do it in R then? So kind of reasonably easily, so let's say we have a, a vector, so that's a, a set of numbers in R for X and a set for Y. So if we were to then run the core for the correlation um, with X and Y, we then get the correlation coefficient out, which is 0.865. So that is a pretty strong positive correlation there. Now, if you would like a statistical test with it as well, there's a function that rolls the two of them together, which is core.test. So it's a correlation test that's combined with a t-test. Um, so a t-test is about difference in means, essentially. But this is saying it is both positively correlated and whether or not that correlation is statistically significant. So depending on what you want to use, Pearson correlation coefficient may or may not be the thing that helps you with that. But the problem is it doesn't really work for more than one variable. It doesn't really work for different distributions, which is why I suggest to you that regression is a little more functional. So regression gives us a lot more options, as I say. So what we're trying to do with the regression is this, essentially. We're trying to fit a line of best fit through our points. And then we're going to try and estimate what that line is doing. So how do we uh, make that straight line assumption from our data? So if we zoom in just a little bit, uh, I've taken just a small section of that plot. So uh, if we were to go back here, I've taken just the, the short bottom part of this plot here and zoomed in. So the way we do this is with the equation of a straight line. So for any of you who uh, saw me harking on about this at the uh, R conference this year, what we've got is uh, exactly what I described there is the equation of a straight line. So we can work this out by understanding the so-called intercept, which is the point where our line crosses zero on our x-axis. Um, we tend to refer to that as alpha in the formulas. Now, no, so that's where our line starts, essentially. So knowing where our line starts, the other thing that we need to know is how much our slope should increase or decrease for one unit of x. So each time x increases by one, how much does our line go up? And that is referred to as our coefficient. So it was a, an x coefficient. And they tend to denote coefficients with a beta. So these coefficients and this intercept, the alpha and the beta, are what we're trying to estimate with our regression model. So where our line starts and then how much our line goes up or down for each unit of x. So what does that look like in a formula? So here we've got y, so this is the thing we're predicting, equals the intercept plus the coefficient times x. And the last thing here is error. So if we go back to our cloud of points here, none of these are, well, one or two of these are stacking perfectly on the line, but most of them are a little bit further away. So the difference between that point and the line is our error. 
But there are a few things that we're making assumptions about, and these are kind of important the, the, the more you dig into this. Uh, so we're assuming that there is an, a linear relationship here. So if there isn't a linear relationship here, you might want to do something slightly fancier. Um, and the talk I was able to give at NHSR this year talked about one of those methods, which is um, using a generalized additive model, but that's a little bit out of scope for today. Uh, we're making a, an assumption that all of our data points are independent. Um, now, what that means practically to you is that they're not clustered or correlated in some way. So uh, an example that is correlated that's often misrepresented. So I worked on uh, hospital mortality data sets for a long time. So if you make the assumption that all data points are independent, there's a couple of problems with that. So what that means is every single patient's admission across the NHS is completely unrelated, which is not really true because if it's your second or third attendance, you're obviously a bit like you were last time. So you're cor so some of those data points are correlated because they're you as the patient several times. Also, we have a clustering effect at different hospitals as well. So although we don't like to admit it, patients who are treated in uh, Coventry or are Blackpool or Leeds are a little bit like the more like the patients in those areas treated by those services than they are like the average patient, if you know what I mean. So we have um, a correlation assumption. So sometimes that's ignorable in many cases, but to lay, you know, the simple linear model is assuming all of your data points are independent. So you have to have a little think about your data generating structure as to whether or not that actually truly reflects what you're doing. Uh, we're making an assumption of normally distributed error. So for those of you who've seen the, the normal distribution, it's kind of a bell curve. So it's uh, we have a midpoint, a high point in the middle, which is the mean, and we have about as many points above and below the mean uh, in a symmetrical fashion. And the further you get from the mean, the fewer points that we have. We're assuming that our it's not, strictly speaking, that our data are normally distributed. It's that the error around them is normally distributed. So visually, that means that there is as much error above the line as there is below the line, if that makes sense. Uh, and this horrible word to say at the end of homoscedasticity or homoscedastic, um, and it's it, its opposite, which is heteroscedastic, um, it means that the variance is equal across the whole range. So again, going back to this here, if all the points were very tightly clustered around this line here, but the further you got up here, the points were actually scattered much further from the line. Um, what we've got there is a change in the variance over the range of it. So regression is assuming that we have a constant variance across the whole range of our data. And if you haven't, it tends to underestimate the variance. So that's a lot of, um, that's a lot to say there, but broadly, what we're trying to do is fit that line of best fit with the intercept and then the coefficients, how much we go up for each point. And what we do to actually estimate that, or the machine does for you, is it uses the residuals, so the distance from the, uh, the line. Now, let me illustrate this for you here. So for the perfect line for the these data points would be the point at which the error above and the error below is zero. So we would have exactly the same amount of error above as we would below, and that would be the, the midpoint for that line to run through. Now that's slightly harder for a machine to estimate than it is if they're all on the one side. So the way it's done is that we normally square them. So we square this distance, the so-called residual distance here, uh, and then we minimize the sum of those squares. So if you hear the term sum of the squares in this or ordinary least squares, that is the technique that's used for fitting a linear regression. It's also used in so many other things. So you find them in all parts of machine learning. You'll find it in various sections of um, neural nets. All sorts of um, fancier methods are often using ordinary least squares to fit things, albeit in a much fancier fashion. So we've got our intercept, we've got how much our line goes up, and we're estimating those two things by minimizing this squared distance. That's what regression is doing under the hood, but you don't have to do it. So how do we do it then in R? So let's go about it. We're going to use here uh, 
So this is our syntax and I'm going to explain what it's doing here. So firstly, we're using a, a data frame that I've just called my data just to illustrate here. So you do need to specify if you're using data from a data frame, which data frame that data is coming from. Otherwise, R doesn't know. We're fitting the linear model function or LM. And inside that we're saying why and this tilde here is a model formula so functionally if you could treat that as uh, I tend to think of it as as is explained by so we're saying linear model where y is explained by x using a data frame called my data now I like to assign models to objects so you can just run this section without assigning it to an object and it will just run the model, but it won't save or persist that model because you haven't told it where to save it. So if you name the model, first of all, before you run it, so this will run the linear model and it will save it as model one. Then you can reuse model one in lots of other functions, um, particularly in summary and plot and predict, which is what we, we want to do with our model. So the next thing, once you've run that model, is I would suggest you want to run the summary on that model. And that gives you an output like this. So that might look a little bit difficult to decipher at first, but I'll run through it. So the first bit here at the top is a thing called the call, which the call is just reading back to you what model you fitted. So you fitted a linear model where the formula was Y is explained by X. The next bit is a little summary of the residuals. So you remember we were back a few slides ago, we had the residuals here, which is this distance from each of the points from our line of best fit that we're fitting. And this is actually a description of the distribution. So the median should be the midpoint, and this is the minimum value and the maximum value, the first quartile and third quartile. So it's actually a little Descript, like a so like a five number summary, if you like, of, of the distribution of the residuals. And for those of us who could read distributions like that. I'm sure that's helpful, but I prefer to plot them and I'll show you in a minute. Now, the things that we're interested in are our coefficients, the things that the model is estimating. So firstly, the intercept or the alpha that was in there. So this is telling me that my model starts and crosses the, um, the, the zero on the x-axis at five. So y equals five when x equals zero. Um, Similarly, for each unit of X, our Y increases by 1.25. We've also got some other things here, which is a standard error around our estimates. Um, T values, for those of you who know what T distribution is, if you're doing a T test, but we won't go into that today. And this is a, a P value at the end, the, the fabled P value of statistical tests, which we generally by consensus tend to be looking for a p-value of less than 0 0.05 meaning um, a sort of 95 percent principle so we don't assume that it's significant unless it's in the outlying furthest five percent i've actually got a little key here to make life easier for you so the number of asterisks tells you the uh, level of significance if it's so small if the p-value is so small as to be vanishingly small almost zero it'll give you three asterisks if it's around the 0 0.01 range it will give you two if it's 0 0.1 give you one 0.5 will give you a, a full stop etc so here we can see that these are definitely significant and is vanishingly small the p-value and that, now that makes a lot of sense right when you look at this because it's a really straight kind of fit yeah um, so it's a really good estimate because it's artificial data and the other things that we've got there are some diagnoses of how well our model fits. But the thing that I'll draw your attention to are the um, the R squareds here. So these are two slightly different methods for the same sort of thing. But R squared here is a measure of the proportion of the variation in Y that's explained by X. So it's a percentage of how well our model is doing, basically. So here we're saying that our model is explaining 75%, so 0.748, and this slightly different method is saying 74%. So our model is explaining a heck of a lot of the variation in Y just by fitting X to it. So we could get some reassurance that actually we've got a fairly decent model there. So our interpretation then. So we got an intercept value that was 
and a coefficient that was 1.25. So just to hop back to that there, uh, so it's 5.47. Have I put the wrong value? Oh, yeah, 5.48. I've rounded it up and 1.25. So this is an annoying thing to do, but I would encourage you while you're learning to try and say these sentences back to yourself about regression models. So try and interpret them in, in this way. So we're saying for each increase of one in X, Y increases by 1.25 starting at 5.48. So we start at the intercept and each time we go up one in Y, so in, sorry, in X, Y increases by 1.25. So that is back to our square here, 5.48 start. And then for each unit of one, we're increasing by 1.25. There is another thing that you can do if we've not got enough things to do already. Um, but because that can be a little bit complicated to interpret, one of the things that's commonly done is so-called mean center and scale transformation. So rather than fitting X to explain Y, we fit the mean X and we divide X by its standard deviation. Why would we do that? Well, this then transforms it into a thing called a Z score. And a Z score is a measure of the variation. It's also a, a relative measure. So it doesn't matter what your original scale is, a Z score is a Z score. So a Z score of one would indicate you are one standard deviation above the mean. A Z score of minus two would indicate that you're two standard deviations below the mean. And because of the central limit theorem, we know that two standard deviations either side is roughly 95%, uh, and three, I say, is roughly 99%. So you're fitting the model essentially on a, a, a it's not an approximate scale, it's an exact scale, but it's, uh, it's, a tr it's transformed to units of standard deviation. So that sounds really complicated, but it comes into its own when you try and interpret it. So you remember our original model gave us this estimate here of 5.47 for the intercept and 1.25. Oh, let me go through the actual panels. Uh, whereas the scaled model, this changes things around. Actually, this the same model fitted to scale has given us very different um, figures. So why is that? Well, that's because of the mean centering and the scale. So firstly, the intercept now becomes the average Y value. So if we go back there for a second, so this means that the average Y across our data set is 18.24. And then for every increase of one in our standard deviation, Y goes up 4.72. So for anything where you want to be assuming essentially the mean and looking at the difference from the mean, it's actually a really intuitive way of looking at it. It doesn't change the underlying regression model. It's just a scale adjustment. So you've got two options. You can fit it on the original data or you can fit it on the uh, mean centered and scaled data. So our, our interpretation then becomes that the average, um, so that should be the average Y, not the average X. Uh, the average Y is 18.24 and I've got an extra stray. Um, Point there, um, but for each increase of one standard deviation in X, Y increases by 4.72. And then the very last thing I'll draw your attention to, I said, we wanna be sure of the variance across our, th our um, data. So what that means is we wanna probably plot the residuals. So uh, if you were to call the plot model one argument, it then prints four diagnostic plots for you. And these are the first two. So firstly, this fits the residuals here and the fitted values. And what you want really is for them to line up across the range here. And this is, a, it wiggles a little bit, but broadly it's fitting fairly well. And a QQ plot is another sort of version of the same thing. We would, uh, if our residuals were exactly as expected, they would line up straight across this line, across the QQ plot. This is a theoretical distribution of them. And there's a couple of other things again. So we have a standardized residual rather than just a residual, uh, which uh, helps us understand when we've got extreme values, essentially the standardization pulls them in. 
Uh, and there's another thing here called Cook's distance, which again, we won't go into today particularly, but this is about the, the so-called leverage. So this is where the particular points have stronger influence uh, on the outcome than others. And we could see points 45, 47 and seven here seem to have more of a bearing than the other points. Um, these don't really affect it particularly. I would say, look at these two, first of all, check that your model is lining up across the lines of the, of the first two plots, and then you should be, you should be good. So that was a lot to hit you with to start with. But hopefully what we can do now is step through um, the first exercise. We can go through building some regression models. Um, and I'm going to give you, um, let, let's say half an hour for this first one, um, because you'll be getting used to it. Um, but do take a bit of time to go and get yourself a drink, etc. Uh, and then we will move on again. Uh, well, in fact, I'll start going through the results at uh, three o'clock. Okay, so let me show you where they all are. So for those of you who are in cloud, it's timed out slightly here. So let me just reload it. <clears throat> Chris, whilst that's loading, um, yes. one of the, one of the uh, challenges I always have is the convincing myself about the normality of the distribution of the residuals. Yep. When someone says, have you followed all the checks of your plotting and before you, you go with some results, how rigorous do we need to be when applying it to NHS data? Uh, well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think um, it's never perfect, right? Uh, uh, unless you design your data for, for a training exercise, it, it's never perfect. So I think provided it's not, so that there isn't really a rule of thumb, right? That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to plot their data and visualize it and look to see whether or not it looks like there's any strange patterns or whether we've got linear relationships. So to see whether or not it's, it's sort of suitable in the first place. Um, I just got a comment there asking uh, someone's going to go to a meeting shortly. Um, yes, you can certainly access it all later. I believe we're recording today, so that will go online as well. Uh, but all the material will stay available on GitHub. And uh, we'll make sure that's sent out and around again afterwards. And if you are able to come back to the, uh, the session, we'll let you back in anyway. Yes, yes, of course. Um, but I think you have to you have to try it and see with these models. You have to try and fit them and then look at the diagnostic plots uh, and see if it looks terrible, basically. This, that's exactly the problem I had with my PhD study, was I fitted what should have been a reasonable regression model to it. And they, the diagnostic plots looked terrible, and I just had no idea where to go with it. Um, but that, that's when you then need to backtrack and start thinking about how your data is set up, which is why I made those comments, I guess, earlier about the clustering and stuff. So it's worth knowing how your data is structured. That, as well. that was a good start because I never really thought of it that way because obviously there's going to be some interrelation between them. Yes, yeah. And that's the thing. I think it's okay to make simplistic assumptions. You just have to be aware that you're making them, you know? And if... Um, if things are, are are too simple, they can obviously affect things. But sometimes, if you've got a model that's sort of good enough, um, you you might be able to, to to sort of get away with it essentially, which is what a lot of people fitting models do. Uh, also got a comment there. I don't know if I missed something at the start, but do we need to load any packages? Um, so for the most part, you won't need to load any packages. No. Uh, so if you've got the material. Um, for the course, either you're in cloud like I am here, or you've downloaded it from GitHub. Um, if you open uh, in the main directory exercises one and two, um, so the, there's two on each page, um, I'll step through what this is first. Where you need a new package, um, it might, uh, I've probably listed where you need to, to install them, um, which I think I do in exercise three and four. But uh, just to explain here, what we're going to use is a, a sort of a, a famous regression study, if you like, uh, which is the Framingham data sets. This is a big cohort study in the US um, that's been long standing for many, many years. And it was about cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's been responsible for much of what we, we knew about cardiovascular disease, um, uh, sorry, uh, heart disease and smoking and other things as well. So it's sort of long-standing, reasonably open data set as well, but it's the, the study is still going on. It's a long-term follow-up study. So if you were to open one and two, what I've done here is I've written a load of comments at the top. So the things that are in green here are all comments just to explain things. Um, what you need to do is run this first command here on line 11. 
which loads from a CSV that's in our uh, data folder here. Um, it loads a data set called Framingham into the environment. And if you were to click here uh, in the top right in the environment, you should now see that there's a data frame here called Framingham. Now, just underneath it here, um, we've included a key just to help you navigate the data set. So this is explaining what some of the columns are and how they're coded. So there's a column called male, for example, and in that column, uh, a coding of zero means female and one means male. There's a column called age, uh, which is the age at an examination time, uh, etc. So this explains the different columns here, and we're going to use some of these columns here to explain um, other parts uh, of the total study. So we'll be looking at things like the blood pressure, um, the 10-year uh, um, risk, uh, CHD, um, and other things. So. The exercises are then laid out in sequence, so they're all um, they're all done with uh, questions. So originally, when I first put this course together, there was a sort of minimum requirement for people to have used um, enough R to be able to to find their way through an, an analysis. But not everybody has had that necessarily. So if you would prefer to pick up the solution and step through the solution and then try and read the output and understand what the output is, then then by all means. But if you feel able to, uh, using the slides and your other knowledge try and work your way through. So the first part here is saying, with the Framingham data, let's have a look at the data frame first of all. I, I like to inspect the data to understand what it is. So you can use summary, and summary gives you, uh, for each of these columns, um, the mean, median, et cetera, the range. But I find those summaries a bit hard to understand personally. And I come from a background of having used Excel as my first tool. So I quite like to have a look at the data frame, if I'm honest. So I tend to use view. And it lets me get a little an eye on the data and I can understand, OK, so total cholesterol and blood pressure and things are higher numbers here. Most of these things here look like if they're zero and ones, they're indicators of presence or absence, right? And you can scan through it that way. Now, the first section is to try and encourage you to visualize the data. If you're not okay with visualizing data, I'd encourage you to, to go and pick up the solutions here and use it. But I was going to use ggplot, which does actually require loading a library, um, as was asked a second ago. So I'm going to use ggplot2, um, because this is a sort of standard R plotting library, really. Um, and if it's not in the environment, you will need to install it. So uh, R helpfully realized that I'd said load ggplot and I don't have it. So it popped, R Studio popped up a thing here saying, do you want me to install it? And I clicked yes. Um, now, if you can't do that, you can go through the tools menu and click install packages. And if you type in there, ggplot2, it will install from there as well. Or you can script it here as well from install.packages. And then remember to put it in speech marks. And once you've got it installed, then you can uh, load it with library. So firstly, I'm going to draw a histogram, as I said here, draw a histogram or box plot uh, to, to visualize the distribution of the systolic blood pressure column. So I am going to demonstrate that first of all, ggplot, uh, and then I'm going to give it the data set Framingham. Hopefully I spelt it right. Framing um, Now we generally use an aesthetic or an AES mapping to tell it what columns to put where. So I need to tell it what to put on X and Y. In the histogram, you only need to give it X because Y is a count of the, of the variables. So we're going to use um, AES X equals sys. Sys BP, which is the name of the column here. Also, again, described in the code book above underneath there. And then I want to tell it what shape to draw. So I told it what data set to use and what column to map. And in ggplot language, these are geomes or geometric shapes. And there's a geome histogram. So if I put nothing else into this, it will draw a histogram for me, but it'll probably look fairly ugly. OK. So there we've got systolic blood pressure. Now this 
comes back to Stuart's question a, a minute ago, although you were talking a bit about residuals. So this isn't perfectly normally distributed, right? So where we've got this peak here, we'd probably want it to be equal on either side, but it's probably okay because by the looks of things here, we've got one kind of fairly bonkers result out the far end and a few really high ones, but most of it is concentrated in here and it's probably to all intents and purposes normal enough, if you like. So that wouldn't give me too much in the way of worries to start um, visualizing it. So then if you want to work your way through some of the others, um, let's give you um, another 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then I'll, I'll pick up the solutions and start running through that. Uh, do forgive me for just a second. I'm going to run and grab a drink and then I'll be back for any questions. Hello, back again. Uh, do shout or drop into the chat if you need any help with anything, uh, but I'll leave you to get on with it for a bit because you do need some time to look at it and have a play. Okay, Chris, whilst people are going through that, uh, discussing normality. Is normality important for the distribution of the actual Um, so I, I lost the last bit of your sentence there, Stuart. Oh, you're still here. I think we may well have lost Stuart for a second. Or oh, lost his sound. So I think what he was asking there was about. Uh, is being recorded. So I got I got disconnected then. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I suspected as much. Is that because uh, that's the question? Yeah, yeah, it was deliberate. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so you were asking about um, how important is normality of the so it's, it's the y variable, is it? Yes. The thing we're predicting. Um, it depends on who you ask, essentially. I think most people would be more comfortable with the Y variable being normally distributed, but it, I, I think really that assumption is about the error. Yeah. So it's about the, the residuals being above and below the line that we fit rather than the Y variable itself. So I suppose the next stage would be thinking about doing transformations, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's a common thing. We'll we'll look at a generalized linear model which sort of formally transforms it and makes a different assumption about the error. But one sort of halfway house would be to do something like uh, do a log transformation of that and then fit log y. Right. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the expectation of NHS data again being sort of normally distributed is like quite heroic. Yeah, it, it it's not most. I mean the. Um, particularly discrete data. So I think I, sp I spent a lot of time working on discrete data over the years and stuff like length of stay is um, a non-starter for, for for normality, basically, yes. because um, it's so it's it's Poisson distributed, which I'm probably going off piece a, a little bit here, but um, the Poisson distribution is uh, the distribution of count data, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. But it has a couple of properties that suit that. So it can't go below zero, which makes rational sense with a count, right? Because you can't have less than zero length of stay, for example. Uh, and if you're counting length of stay in days, you've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. You've never got 1.2, etc. So it truncates at zero um, and it tends to have a long tail of the distribution. So with something like length of stay, you've probably got most people who are in two or three days, but you've got some who are in longer and you've got some who have been in 50 plus days, 
Yeah. But there's very few of them, and it would be probably more exaggerated than this blood pressure plot here. So would you recommend any literature or extra resource people looking into this sort of work? Uh, oh, certainly. There's some really good books on um, Parson-related stuff, particularly in Canada. So we're going to use, um, in the generalised linear model section, uh, so three and four, we're going to use um, the count package, which comes from a book called Negative Binomial Regression, which um, sounds very fancy, but it's about count data with correlations. And that's really good, but it's a bit mathsy. Um, I'm going to sound really pretentious and self-reference here, but I've got a whole load of resources on it uh, listed as the references in my thesis because I wrote a theory section on how to do count stuff. So I'd have to go back and pull it out and find out what the references were. But if people are interested in count data, uh, yeah, do do drop me a message just... afterwards. I, I'll be very happy to point you in the right direction. I so find I have to... Hmm. I, I find I have to... Um, so although I've done a like a stats PhD, I'm I'm not a maths person originally, if that makes sense. So I I can only get so far with high theory books. I have to see them with data and understand them. Yeah. So um, I think some of it is playing around with data. And the unfortunate thing about Poisson regressions is you don't have as many tools to work out whether it's wrong as you do with a linear regression. Mm -hmm. I think I'm trying to get to the point where we can have the explanations for our senior colleagues. Mm -hmm. and say, how have you done that? Why have you done it? And be sort of happy enough with your assumptions to be able to stand up to it and say, yes, this is why I've done it this way. Yes. And it's been backed by a theory and also by other people in the NHSR community who've done these pieces of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should probably put some resources together. We've got we've got like a how-to repository that we've been setting up recently, yeah. um, which I haven't looked in great detail, but Chris Beattie was talking about this at the conference. Let's see if I can find that. But I think oh, I can't uh, seem to type today. Okay, so, so I think the idea of this uh, is not just about our techniques, but it's also about doing particular pieces of pieces of analytical work. So there's a thing here that says CCG mergers, example, chloropleth, ICB map, uh, KHO3. Well, that looks like someone's been doing count stuff, presumably. That's about downloading and processing KHO3 data, for example. So it would be good to have in a place like this some of the theory stuff as well. So we've got statistics yeah. there. I wonder what's in that. Okay, so that's an example of doing some restats. Yeah, we should we should definitely put some more into this, I think. Yeah, that'd be excellent. No, well, thanks, Chris. Yeah, no problem. No problem. So it's always hard on these sorts of sessions to know how people are getting on because no one wants to put their hand up and say, I'm, I'm struggling or this, that, the other. Um, and not everybody is even always doing the exercises because you've got other priorities and, and the emails never stop and such, right? But if anyone has got questions or does want a bit of help, do shout out, please. Or if anybody's going doing really well with it. True, yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know if I am doing well, but I went down the route of doing GG plot, um, yep. blood pressure and BMI, and then I put yep. a geom point and a geom, geom smooth, just to. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, see what okay. it is. that's all I've done. Let's let's try and replicate that, shall we? So I'm going to um, cheat because coding is cheating half the time, right? Um. Y equals BMI. GM. Uh -huh. so, that, so that sort of thing. So we're scattering it out and we're seeing there. Uh, so there's a few things that I'd think about this here. So firstly, it's a huge cloud of points, right? Um, so I wouldn't have a huge amount of hope for... Um, having a very clear relationship necessarily. So, you know, when we saw the um, 
the correlation visualization earlier with the cloud of points in the middle that was more like a zero. But we do seem to have out this, particularly at this end, as the blood pressure is increasing, it does seem a bit like the BMI is increasing, but it's not doing a lot earlier in the range with the majority of the data. We've also got less variance around here than we have up here as well. So that might, I mean, that you could say that they're probably outlier points, which they might be, and maybe we should trim them from the data, but maybe there's more variance at the top end than there is at the, at the bottom end of the scale. And that's that's kind of useful to know when you go in because you might expect to see that one of your residual plots is fine at one end and not so fine at the other end. Uh, you said about the GM smooth as well. Um, that's a that's a good option. Um, let's make it red. All right, so that so that's that's kind of helpful, right? So there we've got. Um, so this is fitting. Depending on the number of points you've got, it's either fitting a locally estimated smooth or low S, or it's fitting a, a GAM model, which is a, a smooth regression. But this is trying to summarize the variation. It looks does look like we've got something going up there. Then we've got a bit of an elbow point, like a bit of an inflection point there. And then as we data gets sparser here, the area gets wider because we've got fewer data points it's based on. So yeah, it looks it looks like it's arguable that there's um, some that there's some trend there, right? So one other thing you could do, sticking with GM point. So um, what we're relying on there is the automatic um, selection of what smoother to do, which I think is the method argument. So I'm. So if I go here, yeah, so you've got methods. So here it's making an assumption of a GAM or other things, but you can force it to do other things. So I'm going to force it to do a linear model. So we're going to say method equals LM, and that should be blue. So we'll see a linear fit as well on top of it. Oh, I've left the plus sign there. So yes, the blue line is the linear fit as opposed to the smooth fit. So I'm going to start stepping through some of these. So I'll carry them along with you and then we can start interpreting some of them. So we're going to build a linear model now uh, to predict the systolic blood pressure using BMI as the predictor. So firstly, um, let's call this something cis BMI. And I'm going to index it one because it's model one. I'm terrible at naming things you'll probably find. Uh, so the reason I'm doing that is if we create an object, that means you can then reuse the object to plot and to summarize as we go. So we want to create a linear model, then open brackets. So uh, I'll come back to the formula in a second, but I'm going to put a comma there first and put in the data argument to tell it where to take the data from. So our data is Framingham. But what we want to do up front here is specify an, uh, a formula. So we want to do sys pp. And then we're going to use that tilde to say is explained by BMI. And I think I've got the capitalization right. Um, R is fussy about capitalization. So sometimes you might type something and run it and it says it doesn't exist. Um, but it's worth checking the capitalization because sometimes it's being too literal. Okay, so if I run that, um, see in the console under here this BMI, um, but it, it does it kind of quietly because you've told it to build a linear model. So it's built a linear model. It hasn't shown you any output because you haven't asked for any output. So what we're going to do is use the summary function to see the output. So we're going to use summary, sys, BMI, 
one, and then run that. Uh, so just if it's useful to anyone, I'm using the keyboard shortcut control and enter to run the line, which is why I'm not moving up and clicking run every time. I'm just going to increase the size of this a bit so we can see it better. So this is a bit like we had on the slide before. So first of all, the call is the, the model you specified. The thing that I can't really visualize is the residuals, remember? So that's the, the description of the distribution, the minimum, the quartile, median, upper quartile, and max. But our um, coefficients are what we're interested in. So our intercept is 86.9. Um, so what I should probably have done on that last visualization is have them the other way around. Let's do that. Okay, so. So I think we've not got this going back far enough, which is why we can't see the intercept. Let me just fix that with a scale. Scale X, continuous. And I'm going to give it a limits argument. So limits is a vector of the two limits. So we say the lower limits, so I'm going to say zero. And what's the maximum value? It's less than 60, right? So let's say the upper one is 60. Okay, so that, that forces it back. So actually here, if we were to follow our linear trend down here, it would pass through here and it would give us our intercept at about 86, which is what our model said. Um, but the reason I forced the, the scale was just so you could see that because uh, it was it, the intercept was looked confusing without the, without the full scale, and then for each value, each increase of one in BMI, the systolic blood pressure appears to go up by one point seven six. So starting from eighty six, BMI in, uh, so blood pressure increases uh, by one point seven six for each point in BMI scale. So is BMI significant? Then is the next question. Uh, yes. So if we follow our key here and our significance codes, um, this is a saying saying our p-value is less than two to the uh, the exponentiated power of minus sixteen, which is crazy small. So um, yes, BMI appears to be very significant um, in terms of systolic blood pressure. Now, being rational, of course it probably is. I'm quite overweight. I might be worried about my blood pressure. You know, it makes rational sense, right? Because this is real data from a cohort study. Um, I I'm also an advocate of the rational sense check as well. So if you plot a bunch of things and you can understand what they might mean, it's always a good sense check to see whether your model suggests something completely irrational, uh, which this doesn't, right? So is BMI significant? Yes, it is. How much variation in systolic blood pressure does BMI explain? Now, I don't know if you remember from going through the slides a minute ago, but we were looking at, uh, there were two different methods for the so-called R squared calculation. So we've got them here on our output, and actually they're really low. So we've got about 10% according to both measures. So we're saying, it, so this is an interesting picture now. So it's, it's definitely significant in terms of a relationship if you if you model systolic blood pressure on BMI. But BMI really only explains about 10% of the variation in systolic blood pressure. That also kind of makes sense, right? Because surely it's about a whole bunch of other factors. So importantly, the predictor is definitely significant but the model as a whole is only explaining about 10% of the variation. So we also talked a little bit um, on the end about a maybe slightly confusing way of doing things, but using the scale. And when we use the scale argument, it transfers our interpretation of the um, 
intercept to the average value. And then our beta coefficient is about the change in one standard deviation or one Z score. So let's do the same model again. But I'm going to index it up to two. And I'm going to alter this by scaling BMI. No, let's uh, change the index. I forgot to change the index to two, just so I, I don't save over my original model. So you can see when I create each model, uh, actually for, for our memory, each model is essentially a list of a bunch of different things. It's a list of the data, the residuals, the, the call, et cetera. So if you, are, if you start getting into using regression models a lot, you can actually pull the model apart into loads of different components, depending on whether you want to use bits of them. So let's use summary on that as well. See what that looks like. This is BMI two. Okay. So here, what we've usefully got is our intercept becomes the average systolic blood pressure. So we've now got an average systolic blood pressure of 132 and for a one standard deviation increase in BMI, we would expect blood pressure to go up by 7.18. So I personally find that interpretation a bit more helpful, but not everybody does, obviously. So it depends on how you want to use it. So again, in terms of the interpretation, what we're saying here is the average blood pressure is 132. And for each standard deviations increase in BMI, we would expect blood pressure to increase by 7.18. Now it's exactly the same model as before, so you'll see it's got the same R squared values, it's still only explaining 10% of the variation. All we've done is change the scale of the inputs, so the scale of the coefficient is different. If we go back up to the previous one, our interpretation here so you, you could say that the intercept is um, the value of the blood pressure for someone with a zero BMI, you know, which is true and correct because that's what the intercept is. It's a zero. But no one has a zero BMI, right? So it, in some senses that the traditional explanation of it is a little bit esoteric because it, it it's not possible. Um, so that's why I find they're using the mean personally to be a little bit more intuitive. Okay, so it's 10 past three. Um, I'm going to give you till quarter past uh, if you're still playing around with this. Um, do try fitting those models. Do particularly look at the summary and then try and interpret it and say what the model means as interpretation to yourself say about your average values or your intercepts and what the coefficient means and we'll start the next section uh, at quarter past. Hi, can I just ask a question about the second interpretation of the model? Oh, okay. sorry, I was muted. Yes, of course. Please go for it. <laughs> um, so when you say um, sorry, uh, for each standard deviation increase in BMI, yeah. what, what do you mean? What does that mean? Um, oh, sorry, sorry. It's, it's, a, it's um, I guess, a, a standard kind of statistical concept, if you like, um, of, of the standard deviation. So um, if you can imagine... Uh, all of the BMI values in this case, you've probably got a mean in the center. Mm -hmm. So then we describe the spread of the data around the mean in terms of how far the average data point is from the mean. And we refer to that, that distance as the standard deviation. Yeah. Um, so when we're describing a normal distribution, we normally talk about where the mean is, the value for the mean and the value for the standard deviation. Um, so it, I guess I probably haven't done a very good job of explaining that, but it's the um, 
it's a standard way to describe the spread of data around a mean. Okay. Uh, so if go for it. So if you, is this when you say you move from like 90% of the data to 95% of the data is covered? Uh, yep. Yeah, so if you, um, so the, the maths of the normal distribution mean that if you were to have two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below, your data should be, 95% of your data should be contained within that. Okay. And we refer to those units of standard deviation when they're used in this way as a thing called a Z-score. So you might see on things like um, some of the CQC's output and other things, they have adjusted Z-scores. Um, for organizations for some of their indicators. What that means is that where you are in relation to your mean, essentially. So if you had a Z score of 1.25, it's saying you're 1.25 standard deviations higher than the mean. Um, okay. Which I know it's a bit of it's a relative term and it doesn't mean anything in terms of actual numbers, but I, I would need to, um, I guess, try and draw you a histogram. Let me just have a quick look on my computer. I think I've got. Um, no, I, I think that try makes sense. So for each but... standard deviation, deviation, you move away from the mean, blood pressure goes up by seven. Is what yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way because it, it'll take me too long to, to GG plot it. But I think if I could, I'm going to do some bad drawing in paint. <laughs> so do forgive me. But uh, if we had um, some data. Yeah, so I'll show you that I can't even use paint. Um, we've got our axes here. We would expect uh, a normal distribution to not be like that. Can I do some freehand? To have a shape sort of like this. Imagine that was smooth. <laughs> and the, uh, the mean would be in the center here. And then we would have data points either side of them. And we are trying to work out the average distance that these data points are away from the mean. Mm -hmm. And that will be the standard deviation, which will be sort of roughly this distance or this distance on either side. And you find that in units of standard deviation, you can describe a lot of the mean. So that would be, I guess, I'm a bad drawing that will be to two standard deviations above and two below should be 95% of your data. Yeah. Okay. Whereas the three would take you up to um, around 99%. And that looks like a terrible face, smiley face in the middle as well. But um, broadly, that's probably the worst distributional diagram I've drawn, but ho hopefully I, that I, I illustrates love, I love a bit. The, I love the genuine, genuine nature of that. <laughs> I, I, I think we, what we need is a drop-in session on, on stats with Chris. It'd be fantastic. I'd, I'd be signing up for them because it's great. Uh, uh, we we um, are looking at trying to do an NHSR like general statistics course um, from, yes. from kind of scratch as well because I think that would be really helpful. It would. I mean, I mean, I've seen that diagram several times, and I was trying to put a copy of it into the chat with the smiley but, face. No, no, no. This is this is a Wikipedia <laughs> version. Sorry, <laughs> nothing like as uh, en en engaging as yours. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, but, uh, I think the idea of converting uh, the standard deviation back into meaningful units is a tricky one, isn't it? Yes, it, yes, you certainly. Use it for the concept of getting the relevant, then to actually say, what does it mean in real life? When you start yeah. to explain it to clinicians and senior managers, that's when the skill of the statistician comes in. Yeah, and you see it in clinical trials and things all the time. It's got the mean plus standard deviation, but until you actually see it with the real number, it doesn't mean a lot most of the time. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we make best use of time. I'm going to move on. Um, so. We've done a single predictor then. So we've done explaining Y with X. So what happens when we've got more than one thing, um, which is quite reasonable. So let's let's say you've got a, a risk adjustment model. So this is the same sort of thing where you want to adjust for age, sex, deprivation score, and something or other else. That's more than two dimensions, right? So uh, regression can deal with this. So it's not really limited by the numbers of dimensions um, unless you're very short on data. There are some rules about how many data points you really need for uh, how many predictors you put in, but there are methods again that get around that sort of thing. But let's work on the principle of adding just a few more for the moment. 
but we have to change our interpretation slightly. So we have to and suspend your disbelief here for a minute, but we have to assume that if we're considering the coefficient for x1, that we're holding x2, x3 and all the other x is constant. So we have to add this. Uh, so the change in y is whatever our coefficient is whilst holding all other parameters constant. So that might seem like semantics, but if you've got more than one moving point at a time, the interpretation becomes very challenging. But mechanically, all you need to do is put more columns in and put them in with a plus symbol. And I will take as many of them as you put in. But the other thing you might want to do is not put in numerical things. So at the moment, we just put in numerical things. So we put in BMI, systolic blood pressure, and you can understand an increase or a decrease in those things quite easily because they're numeric, right? But what if you've got categorical variables? Let's say you've got cancer stage, for example, and you want you want to put that into a model and you've got stages one, two, three, and four. Um, they are sort of linear, but the, the change from one to two isn't twice as bad as one. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but what if you've got things that are completely nominal, nominal they don't have any ordinal value. So what if you've got um, uh, patient sex, for example, or um, I'm struggling to think of examples now, or like binaries for um, presence or absence of conditions or things like that. So the model, if you, if you just code them as numbers, the model's going to interpret them as numbers and it's going to probably do the wrong thing. So like the cancer stage thing is a, is a good example because it's two is not twice as bad as one necessarily. It is about progression of the disease. But what we can do is we can use a thing called a factor uh, in R and R's um, a factor data type tells R that this is a categorical variable. And what it does is it does a little bit of rearranging of the data underneath. So let's say here we've got um, a column that's coded in our data set as category A, B or C. If you set that to a factor and then you build a model with that column, what it does quietly in the background is it does like a little pivot table for you and it spins it out. So we have the presence or absence of the category coded 0, 1 as a new column. Now we drop one of them um, for reasons of maths, which I won't go into too much at the moment. But in this case, with A, B and C, we have dropped A because A is our reference level. So we're assuming everything is A unless we're told otherwise. Um, then we've got a 0 or 1 as to whether something is category B. And we've got a zero or one as to whether something is category C. So you shouldn't ever have more than one in that category. But this is all done silently in the background if you tell it that something is a factor variable. So let's try that now. Let's move that back over to our, our studio session. If I can get back into cloud without disturbing this banner at the top of the page. OK, so now we've got a few more bits. So let's build quite a few other models now and see if we can compare them. So for part two, sticking with what you've just done before, and you can copy and paste things down. I fully intend to. So pick them up and give them names so you can distinguish. Let's say this is BMI and smoke. So now you want to start adding different things in. So let's build a model for systolic blood pressure where we have both BMI and current smoker. So hopefully that makes sense there. So I've got similarly as before, we're calling our model something. So we save it. We're using a linear model. We're saying systolic blood pressure is predicted by BMI plus and then current smoker. And again, we've got our data argument at the end telling it to get its data from the data frame. So having run that, I'm now going to do the summary. <laughs> 
So I'm going to run through this one with you, but do please uh, code in the background. I'll run through this first one, and then I'll give you some time to, to work through some of the others. So I'm going to do summary of sys BMI smoke. I'll just extend this up again here. So what we've got underneath here then again, so we've got the call first of all. So we're saying the model I fitted was systolic blood pressure is explained by BMI and whether or not someone's a current smoker. Now, mathematically speaking here, this is a zero one thing. So it's a categorical, the current smoker. But if you've only got two categories and they're coded zero one, it's mathematically the same whether or not you call it a factor or you just leave it as numeric. So you'll find that people often just leave binaries of like zero, one, yes, no, without calling them factors. It's when you've got more than two that you tend to use the factor. So if I wrap this in factor, it would still give, probably give me the same model. Um, it'd just be slightly more complicated on the output. So I haven't here. But looking at the output of the model, you'll see this has changed slightly. So the intercept. Uh, appears to have altered slightly um, and that's because um, everything is subject to everything else so when we combine all the effects of the different things actually it looks more like the line would adjust slightly so where it crosses the um, the intercept adjusts slightly so what this model is saying is that we're starting at 90.5 holding all of the parameters constant each increase of BMI increases systolic blood pressure by 1.6. And holding all other parameters constant, being a smoker decreases systolic blood pressure by 3.4. So should we be recommending smoking to reduce blood pressure? Probably not. Keep working your way through the uh, the rest of the models now then but, um, and have a look at the outputs and see how you would go about interpreting them. Feel free to copy them down or if you're going through the um, the solutions, just run the relevant sections and look at the output and, and try and interpret them. So let's go for, go for, go for 10 minutes on that. <laughs> 
So whilst you're working your way through that, I've just copied down and altered the model site to save me some typing time. So we interpreted the first one about the BMI and the current smoking status. Interestingly, our model has improved ever so slightly. We've gone up from about 10% of the variation explained in the R squared here to 11, you know, which is objectively an improvement, but still awful. So let's have a look at the age model instead, where it's just BMI and age. Okay, so straight away, I'll just jump to the R squared there. So we've gone up there to 0.23, so 23% right away. So we've immediately got a much better model by including BMI and age. Now this changes things quite a lot. So our intercept has dropped quite dramatically because of the combined effects of BMI and age. That might seem confusing, but the combination of them alters our best fit line. So imagine by now we've broken out of the 2D graph that we had into a 3D graph. So the line is actually like comparatively complex now already. But it's definitely a better model and BMI and age are both significant. So starting at 48.5, systolic blood pressure increases by 1.5 for each increase in BMI, holding all of the parameters constant. And starting at 48, systolic blood pressure increases by 0.91 for each year of age, holding all of the other parameters constant. So I know it seems like a semantic game, but it's important to remember that you are holding one of them constant whilst you're interpreting the other one. So then the third model is putting the three of them in. So BMI, age, current smoking status. So does this improve our model any further? Actually, not really. It looks like our R squared. It's about the same on the multiple R squared. One on the adjusted R squared, it's slightly less. So it doesn't look like including current smoking status into the model is really adding anything above age. So you've got to wonder what the value of it was before and whether smoking status was indicating something like age, confounding age, because presumably no children, hopefully, uh, at least not very many, would have been smoking. And it would have been a proxy, I guess, for age to a small degree, but that would explain why it was much worse in terms of fit. So this model output here, because current smoker is not significant, actually the p-value is nearly 0.5 here, it's suggesting there's very little value in including current smoker in this model. So the previous model, just BMI and age, could be considered a better model. So if you have factors in there that aren't contributing to the fit particularly, you are sort of rationally justified in using a simpler model. Now, there may be reasons why you explicitly want to factor them into the model, but that's because you've got a very clear causal assumption about the things you want to adjust for. But if you're just going on a, a set of testing, it looks here that current smoker is not aiding the fit at all. So the final question here then was how, well, the final two questions is how would you uh, add education into the model? So scanning back up to the top to our key here, we have education. So this is a categorical variable. So this is coded as one equals some high school. So it's a US data, uh, US study. So the school descriptions mean things to US education system. Two means high school or GED. Three, some college or vocational school. And four is college. So presumably there are increasing levels of kind of further educational achievement. But they're not linear. 
So high school or GED is not two times high school. Um, so they are categorical and they should be considered in that way. So let's take the BMI and age model. We'll add education into it. But we need to do something to it to indicate it's categorical. And what we'll do is wrap it in factor. So like I was saying on the slides before, factor indicates that this is um, a categorical variable to the model. So, so I'm going to just change the name there. Let's add, and then we'll run the summary. So now you will have more factors in here. So first things first, let's look at the multiple R squared, cutting to the chase slightly. So it looks like we've gone up to 23 again there. So it looks like there is some value in adding education into the model. So sort of marginal. Uh, it does appear to have increased it slightly from what it was before, um, even if it's only sort of a quarter of a percent. And so in terms of our interpretation, so we still do the same thing of the hold, holding all of the parameters constant, but we have to understand that these factors here mean difference from the reference level. So an education of level two would indicate 1.33 um, increase in blood pressure compared to level one. So these these coefficients are two compared to one, three compared to one, four compared to one. So it looks like having, what was it called? Uh, having high school or GED compared to just some high school <laughs> increases your blood pressure, whereas uh, some college or vocational decreases your blood pressure um, and college decreases your blood pressure even further. Now, there might be some rationale around the types of jobs people take um, and or lifestyles that are related to is it, wide determinants of health, maybe, but is, is it because children don't have high school yet? Well, it may, yeah, may well be, may well be, yeah. Um, so we can't make a we can't make a too informed an assumption just yet, can we? But it it is interesting to look at the education split. So we've, from a pure mechanics perspective here, what we've done is we've included the education in the layers that it was coded in by wrapping it in factor, and we. Our interpretation then changes to uh, these coefficients being the difference from the reference level. So in this case, one. Uh, you can change the reference level by reordering the factor, but that's a little bit too complicated for today. But do know that if you are fitting these models and you want to specifically set one of them as the reference level, um, you can you can do that. So let's say you've got um, uh, IMD. Uh, index multiple deprivation quintiles and let's say you want to set three as a reference so you can have above and below the reference um, you could code it in such a way that three is a reference level okay so what we'll do there is uh, we'll stop there and I'm going to run through the second section of what we've got on today which is taking a slightly more general approach so we've done a lot about the the linear data there because everything is really based on the linear model. Uh, well, you gotta love a good meme, but um, do remember that if your R squared's terrible, your linear model's terrible. And even though some of your predictors might be telling you something about how significant they are, they might not be doing a very good job of modeling your Y overall. But what do we do about non-linear data? So we talked a little bit about Poisson data before, count data. But what about things like binary data? So I talked a little bit about doing mortality models earlier. So uh, obviously, death is a binary state. It's a have you died or not. It's it's not something we can count. So it doesn't make a lot of rational sense to have Y as zero and one. 
But what we can do is we can apply a thing called the generalized linear model, which is a wider framework. So although linear regression sort of existed first, there is a wider framework bolted around it. Uh, and you can consider linear regression to be a special subset of, of the generalized linear model where you don't have to do any transformations or the transformation is a so-called identity, so it's equal. But what we do here is, so this is the same thing as your linear model before, your intercept plus your beta times x. But what we're doing here is we've now got a so-called um, transformation. So it's a function that we wrap around um, this mu here, which mu is the expectation of y. Now, mathematically, that makes a difference in the distinctions, but it doesn't particularly for you. But what we're doing here is we're essentially building a, a transformed model that builds a linear model on a different scale. So for binomial data, um, we might use um, the, the relevant binomial family. So the transformation there is a so-called logit transformation. So it's a, it's a function. For Poisson data, it's generally a log transformation. So what we're doing is we're fitting a transformed Y with a linear model, and then we can transform back. There is a little bit of extra maths behind it, which assumes the right error distribution as well, but we don't need to worry about that for today. So this is why you can't do exactly the same thing by doing a log transformation and then building an LM model. Uh, because it makes the because although the transformation is the same, it doesn't make the uh, the right assumptions about the error. Um, but mechanically, it works in much the same way. So we tend to refer to this function as the link function. So this is how it transforms the data. But the thing that we described before, the ordinary least squares, where it takes the difference of the residuals from that central line, and it uh, squares them and, and minimizes them. That doesn't hold for these because the fit isn't linear anymore. So there is a more general method that's referred to as maximum likelihood estimation, um, which does the same thing. And strictly speaking, if you did a maximum likelihood estimation for a linear model, it will give you the same thing as the OLS, the ordinary least squares. Uh, but maximum likelihood is much more flexible uh, and can be used for all these different methods. Now, whilst a lot of the stuff that you're going to use for the linear model is the same, and the, the main difference for you coding it is that you uh, you have to put GLM rather than LM, we can't rely on the R squared metric that we used before to work out whether or not our model is a good fit or not. We have to use something that is specific to the type of model. Um, and one of the ones that you can use with binary models is a thing called the AUC or C statistic, which is also called the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve, stappily titled. But if any of you ever done any work around diagnostic testing and stuff, it's the same the same principle as that. But there's a bunch of other things as well. You could do statistical tests called likelihood ratio tests or AIC. So there are other things we can use to judge whether the model is good. So let's build one based on some real data again from the US. Um, using some of the Medicaid data. So we're going to use the count data package that I sort of referenced in passing earlier. And there's a data set inside the, that package called MedPAR, uh, which I think is from data from hospitals in Texas, uh, if I remember correctly. But we're going to load that data set and we're going to build a generalized linear model, a GLM rather than an LM. But it's important that we have to give it one extra argument this time. So we have to tell it what family or what type of distribution it is. So because death is binary, the um, the, sort of the mathematical model for the, the distribution of these binary things is a, is a binomial distribution. So what we're going to do is fit a model, but specify a binomial family. And this is a slightly more complicated model than before. So you'll see some of the components that we used previously. So first of all, we created an object. We've used a GLM. We're saying the data column called died is explained by, so we've got a categorical variable here, factor of whether someone is age 80 or not, plus the column called length of stay, plus the column called type. I think this is similar to like admission type in, sorry, like an admission method in, in the UK. So it's a 
about whether or not there is sort of elective or emergency or, or similar, um, if I remember correctly. But we've got three predictors there, two of which are factors, and one of which is a, um, a continuous uh, variable. And I've run a thing on the end here called the AUC, which I said about before. And the AUC um, can be um, understood in a really similar fashion to the R squared. So it's about the proportion of variation that's explained by the model. Um, it's calculated a bit differently, but you can interpret it in much the same way. So running this particular model on this particular data set on MedPAR, I came out with an AUC of 0.63. So 63% of the variation in our model was, uh, sorry, in our data set was explained by our model. So we are explaining a lot of uh, the risk of whether people died with their age, their length of stay, and what type of admission they were. So if I then run the summary of the binomial, the summary is a bit longer this time. So again, you've got the stuff we recognize, the call, and the residuals, and then the coefficients. Now the coefficients are a bit trickier now because we've transformed things onto the right scale as part of this binomial family, which is a logit scale. So that is, um, strictly speaking, the log odds of death, which is a bit contrived, right? So we generally don't tend to do our interpretation directly on these things. We tend to do a transformation back, which I'll show you in a, mi in a minute. But you can look at the raw output here to determine whether or not the different columns are significant. It looks like factor two, so the type two is, is slightly less significant than the other things, but broadly they're all significant. And there is one other thing I want to introduce to you before we go into the next exercise, which is a thing called uh, an interaction. So some variables have the same effect regardless of any other ones around them. They, they, they could be considered to be independent of other variables, but not everything is. Sometimes the combined effect of variables is different than the isolated effect of them, or they may work together in tandem. And if you don't include one of them, um, you could end up um, under or over adjusting. Now in the Framingham data, uh, particularly, uh, and other similar studies, this has often happened with um, alcohol consumption and smoking, because socially the two things were quite linked. So if you didn't include both of them and their combined effects, um, and you just included one, you were sort of making the assumption that because someone had a high alcohol intake, it was probably fairly likely they smoked as well, but you needed to separate out both effects and their combined effect. Now, in terms of using it in R, all you need to do is add a multiplication um, or a, a colon, and these are slightly different types of interaction, but um, what you really want here um, is to use this multiplication. Uh, so I've got a question about the R squared value. What percentage would you look for for a good model or a poor model? I think, um, again, it varies. Uh, realistically, I probably wouldn't want to push a model into any sort of production if it was under about 0.7. Um, I've got uh, someone unmuted there. Could I just ask you to mute, please? Thanks. Um, it depends on your use case. So if you're building a model that you want to put into production for a predictive model, you might want to be really sure that it's quite predictive before you put that into action. Uh, if you're writing something up for an academic paper because you have a data set and you've done um, an investigation into it, it might be really important that you uh, your data only allows you to explain 0.6 percent, you know, 60 uh, percent uh, of the variation. So it might be that you you can report that, but you should report the fit as well. And occasionally, when I've done peer reviews of stuff, I've um, has been something I've been quite keen to point out. I find particularly, I'm going to sound like I'm clobbering economists again here, but I find particularly in economics papers, you often find very advanced modeling techniques, but you don't tend to find the model fit statistics as to whether or not it actually fitted the data. Um, so I think it's it's quite important to add. So ideally, yes, you find, if you, if you were to Google it, you'll find people saying um, 0.7 to 0.8 is a good fit. 0.8 is a very good fit. 0.9 is a perfect fit or whatever. I, I, I don't put a lot of stock in that personally. Um, 
I, I think it's about confidence in your use case, which is which is sorry, not a very clear answer, right? And I would say if you want to be sure that it's doing good predictions, you want it as high as possible. But if you're trying to explain a real data set, it might be that your real data set isn't capable of supporting that beyond a certain amount. Hopefully that helps. Um, okay. So I just want to demonstrate that interaction again. So interactions being the combined effects. So we have both the individual effects, but the combined effects. So what I'm doing here is I'm assuming that um, being elderly and your length of stay uh, also affect each other. So formally, I'm suggesting there that um, it's likely that if you're older, you are going to stay in hospital longer anyway, but that in itself doesn't predict you dying in the same way that um, having a longer length of stay would for a younger person. So um, bear with me, that's a, compl a complex thing there. We're saying, I'm making an assumption that uh, elderly patients are more likely to stay in hospital in general, independent of the risk of death, possibly because of multimorbidity, uh, possibly because of um, lack of care or discharge capacity or things like that completely separately from the risk of death. So I'm trying to separate that out in the model. Um, and you see everyone in the AUC again there, and it's 0.63, uh, which if we go back and check the last one, it was 0.637. So I've tested it. It hasn't improved the model, um, but it was worth testing that assumption. So if I look at the model here, what it's added is it's added something on the end here, which is the interaction term. So we've got both the age and the length of stay and the age and the length of stay together. Now, if this was significant here, this would tell you that there is an interaction effect and you were right to separate the interaction effects. So this is saying that the thing I've described before isn't true. Um, the length of stay um, and the age were sort of separately quite predictive of death and the combination of them isn't any better at, at doing that. But in some cases, you really do want that length of stay. Uh, so you, you do want something like an age and length of stay uh, combination. So I said before, looking at the link functions, so look, looking at our GLMs, GLMs are necessarily that bit more complicated because they're transformed, right? Like we said, with the binomial distribution or um, the Poisson. But what you want to do is, is transform them back. So when we've built our um, uh, our binomial model, what we did was you did a so-called logic transformation, a log odds, or it was done behind the scenes for you. But in order to reverse that, we use the mathematical function uh, to exponentiate it, which is a backwards transformation. It just undoes the transformation. So you can undo it onto the coefficients and you end up with what we call the uh, an odds ratio rather than a log odds. So you can interpret that as the um, the increase in the, the odds of death, increase or decrease. Um, so rather than this slightly esoteric thing on that scale, we've ended up with um, an odds ratio here. So odds what, I hear you ask. So you might have heard odds mentioned in betting and other things. Um, but it's used in uh, probability quite a lot as well. So to try and get your head around what it means, I've drawn out a so-called two by two table that uh, epidemiologists and statisticians often like. So what we've got here is an exposure. So that's the sort of risk of a thing and then an outcome as to whether or not it occurs. And we've got exposed, yes, outcome, yes. Exposed, no, outcome, yes, et cetera. Outcome, no, exposed, yes, no. So if we, separate those out into A, B, C, D. There's two sort of related concepts. We have a so-called relative risk. So in that sense, a relative risk is the proportion of people who are exposed um, who uh, had the outcome. So it's the proportion of all the people who are exposed who had the outcome. Um, and you might do it for the proportion of people who are not exposed who didn't have the outcome as well. Whereas odds um, is the ratio of the exposed. So, so the odds for the uh, the exposed here are the ratio of those who have the outcome to not have the outcome. And you would have it again um, for the non-exposed. Uh, 
So it's just a slightly different way of rendering it. But what you end up with is a so-called odds ratio. So our, our odds ratio here um, is a sort of a transformation, essentially, because we're doing A over B over C over D, which if you follow the math around of rearranging it, it becomes AD over CB. But it's, it's the same thing functionally. But that means our odds ratios then come out with this interpretation. So if you have an odds ratio of one, the chance of your outcome was the same in each of your groups. So if it's greater than one, the chance of the outcome in the exposure group was higher. So it's an increased risk. And the opposite is then true for less than one. So the chance of the outcome is lower in the exposure group. Um, there is a really useful video here um, I found on it. Um, so I'll drop that in the chat there because odds ratio, like a lot of what we're talking about today is a complicated thing. And I don't um, I don't want to make light of this. It's complicated stuff, right? But um, you're perfectly capable of getting your heads around it in much of the way I did, because I didn't understand it when I started. So if it's useful to you, you know, do, do dig into that. But let's pick up on exercise three and work our way through fitting the generalized linear model. But I think given that we're coming up to four o'clock, Maybe we would be better to go through the solutions and we'll step through them and look at them as we go. Uh, I hope that's okay with everyone. So we make best use of the time. Let's pick up um, from the solutions folder. So I've gone into my local version here rather than the R Studio on um, the cloud. Uh, let's go back to cloud. I'll go away controls. I can't seem to get my controls to go away. Ah, brilliant. Let's resume. So yeah, I uh, I make no bones about this. It is it is complicated stuff, but it all stems from us trying to explain why using X or multiple X's, and the generalized linear model just allows us to do non-linear fits by transforming things with a function like a log or a, a logit, but it necessarily makes life a little bit harder. So uh, you gain flexibility, but you lose interpretability, if you like. And that's that's true for almost all the, every time you'll see things sold to you as an AI system, the more complicated it is, the more you sacrifice explainability. So what we're going to do here, um, I'll pick up from the solutions folder rather than there. So this uses the um, a package called NHSR datasets. Uh, it's also telling me that LM test and model metrics are not installed. So I'm going to click on that and it will install in the background. So the NHSR datasets package uh, is a toy package that contains some real data that we've taken from public sources uh, and also some uh, made up data that we use in training and, and learning. Uh, but it's free and it's available. It's on CRAN. So, you know, if you're trying to learn your way around R, there's a bunch of data sets in here that you can use. And we're going to use one called LOS model, length of stay model. So I'm going to use a data function to load that. So that's a data set that's inside the NHSR data sets packages. And um, what I might do actually is just, uh, I'll just clear my session. So we've, uh, we don't have too many things clogging up the workspace. Okay, so um, again here, this is a, a data frame, just like we saw before. So I've got uh, an ID, which is just a row ID. Um, and this is a pretend hospital data set, a very, very minimal hospital data set, right? So we've got an organization that they went to, trusts one to 10. We've got the age of a patient. We've got the length of stay, so the number of days they're in hospital. And then we've got a binary indicator for whether or not the patient died. So I'm just, uh, I've just looked at it with those. Um, let's run summary as well. So. The summary of the ID doesn't tell us anything because it's just a row ID. The summary on organization here tells us there's 30. Um, there's 30 data points at each trust. And the age ranges from five to 95. 
and the mean is 50. Uh, the length of stay ranges from 1 to 18, and the median is 4. And death doesn't tell us very much because it's either 0 or 1 again. OK, so our first model then, we're going to build a generalised linear model. So we're going to use GLM instead of LM to predict the column called death, and death is a 0, 1. So that's a binary. So hopefully you remember from those slides a minute ago that um, for the binary models, we're going to use the binomial distribution. And you tell um, the GLM that by using the family argument. So underneath here, I'm going to create GLM1 using GLM. Death is explained by age from the length of stay data set, but I'm telling it the family is binomial. So that's created that model for me. I'm going to use a summary to look at it. OK, so what we've got here, again, the call, the residuals, the intercept, um, and the age. But this is on that transformed scale again. So it's the log odds, which doesn't make sense to most normal humans, me included. Um, but let's use these helpful little significance indicators. So is our model telling us that uh, age is significant? Uh, well, yes, it is. So really, if we were making a strict interpretation based on the uh, the odds scale, we're saying the log odds of death um, increases by, so it should be rounded up to 0 0.012. I put the wrong value in there. Uh, for each increase in age, starting at a log odds of minus 0.18. Now that doesn't mean a lot to us really. So what we might want to do uh, is use a scale model and maybe we might want to transform it back. So let's change age over to um, scale like we did before the mean centering and the scale. So if I run that here. So now we've got uh, the mean interpretation of the intercept. So we're saying the mean log odds per patient is minus 1.57. Whereas the um, for each standard deviation increase in age, uh, we will say the risk of death or the log odds of death is increasing by 0 0.033. Now, the intercept in particular is really uninterpretable to most of us. But what we need to do is to transform it back so we've got an odds ratio. So let's firstly do it for model one. So what I've done here is I've used COF. So COF is for coefficients. It's an extractor function from the first GLM. So if I was to run that, just COF GLM, you see it pulls out the coefficients. But I've wrapped it in the EXP or exponentiate function which is the reverse of the transformation that we did in the in the model. So this takes it back to our normal scale and we have um, we now have log odds. So to interpret the first model here GLM1 we're saying the um, the meet, the log odds of death the sort of zero log odds of death was um, 0 0.01 and for each increase in, of one in age, the log odds of death increases by 1.01. 1 .01. Uh, if it stayed at one, um, then uh, it would indicate that there's there's no there's no increase in the risk of death um, based on age. So it's actually only very slight. So really, we could say it's only about a one percent increase um because of our odds ratio maths that we showed before on the previous slides. So if it stays at one, we're assuming it's the so it's the it's the, the ratio of the two is the same. If we run it for number two, which uh, had our mean centering and scale that shifted up. So we've now got a mean odds of death or an average odds of death. So the average odds of death is 0.2. And the odds ratio uh, increases 
here. So we've got uh, the for each increase of a standard deviation of one, the log odds is 1.39. So it's about a 39-ish, 40% uh, increase in age in the risk of death for each increase of the standard deviation of age. So TLMs are much trickier to interpret, but they're very, very flexible. So let's add something else into it. Let's add length of stay. So we're not going to major too much on the interpretation of these models, but what we're going to do is look at uh, how that changes. So looking again just at the significance based on this summary, we've got again got a significant intercept. Age has now become non-significant, but length of stay has become significant. So we're saying that when we adjust for both age and length of stay, it appears that um, age is not predictive of death. Now, using our kind of sense check thing that we described earlier, that sounds a little bit bonkers to me. So maybe there's something else going on. Um, so I'm just going to skip over those tests there for a second and we'll go down to um, the next section here from 92 onwards. So let's test out the interaction thing so the thing we had on the slides before was we tested an interaction about whether or not length of stay and age interact so whether we make an assumption that maybe um the elderly stay in more routinely a longer time independent of the risk of death so that would mean that if you are both old and have a long length of stay you probably need it blunting in some way because you've got the two extremes of the predictor for example so let's run that model and test it. So firstly, we'll look at the output. So as described here, so we'll ignore the intercept for a minute. So both age and length of stay are significant. Length of stay more so. It's kind of an order of magnitude higher. But the combined effect of age and length of stay are actually negative. So what I was describing a second ago is that if you are both quite elderly with a long and have a long length of stay, you would be overestimating that person's risk of death without the interaction. The interaction allows it to blunt that as those two increase, which is why we've got the negative there. So where there is a plausible link between some of your predictors that might affect each other, it's worth you testing an interaction term. It doesn't mean you need to retain the interaction term if it either doesn't make any rational sense or whatever else. Uh, or it's not significant. But the next logical question is, why don't you just do everything with interaction terms? You know, why don't you fit everything in your model with interaction terms? And surely you're covered then if you've got an interaction, right? Well, a, cu a couple of reasons. Uh, it makes your model hugely complex and unnecessarily complex. And if you have a very complex model where a lot of it doesn't predict the outcome, um, you tend to get worse fit and worse performance. It also takes a very long time for the model to run. so. Use interactions sparingly, but use them to test situations where there might be interactions between your predictors. OK, so uh, the other thing that I just skipped over a second ago was about how we might test whether the models are good. Going back up to GLM number three. So on the bottom of our GLMs here, we have a thing called AIC. Stuart, you got a hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering. Is there a, a, an easier way of testing the number of interactions it's worth trying? Right, right, uh, there might be, and, I, and I don't know. I'd be pretending if I said I knew that. Um, right. There's no there, matrix you can think of we can try. Uh, there's, there's a, a rationale for the number of events that you need um, in order to have more predictors. Um, right. So depending on who's literature you read. Um, I, I trust there's a chap called Frank Harrell who spoke at last year's NHSR conference. Frank Harrell's quite um, well regarded in the field and he's always had a rule of thumb of um, certainly with a binary model like this you need at least 10 deaths for each predictor that you have in the model. Right. So um, if you've got only 100 cases and you've only got 10 deaths really you can only have one predictor in that model uh, and, and obviously it scales. So the more okay. you have, the, the the more the more options you have. 
I suppose this uh, goes, to, it goes back to the point of knowing your data, doesn't it? Knowing what's it reasonable. does, it does, yeah. Um, and it, I think the machine learning school of thought tends to go with a throw everything in because we've got big data and it doesn't cost us anything. Yeah. Now, that goes against the the more traditional statistician point of view, which has tended to be, we don't have a lot of computing power. How are we going to use it wisely? Um, so that was always founded on the principle of well, what's rational, first of all. Um, I would probably advocate the what's rational approach. It doesn't mean you can't test things, um, yeah. but it's always good to start from a rational basis. If you're particular, so you, you can view a model as an explanatory model where you're trying to work out what predicts things or as a prediction model where you don't care, you just want everything that predicts to be in the model just in case. So depending on your use case, you can go either way. But I would I would advocate always a bit of theory as to what you put in in the first place. Yeah, you'll have to explain it at some point, won't you? Yes, yeah, yeah, quite. Okay. Um, yeah, no problem at all. Um, so, uh, I, sorry, I've been terrible with my timekeeping today, so I will, I'll, I'll nip through the last bits and we'll, we'll whiz through the, the section four as well in a sec. Um, but the other thing to know is there's a thing here called AIC, which stands for ACIC Information Criterion. Now, this is a relative measure. Um, it doesn't mean anything on its own, but you can use it to compare models. So each one of these models, GLM2, so one, two, three, et cetera, has an AIC value. And a lower AIC means a better model, essentially. Uh, it means that you lose less information is the interpretation of it. So when you can't rely on an R squared, like I've said before, but you want to compare whether your ne your second model is better than your first model, if you compare the AIC values between them and one of them is lower, that's the better model. So taking, uh, so I'm going to just uh, slam together the using some other R functions to bind them together. The AIC from mo model one and the AIC from model three. So what we've got here, model one has got 279 and model three has got 273. So what we're going to say here is that the model with uh, model three was better than model one because the AIC is lower. And there are a bunch of other methods. So we can use um, a like, so-called likelihood ratio test. Uh, when there's a couple of functions for that, you can either use the LM test library, which has got this function called LR test, likelihood ratio test. Um, helps if I load it first, doesn't it? And this, much like you've seen before, tests the two of them and it gives you that p-value on the end here. And again, the significance codes. So we're saying that model three is a significantly better model than model one. Or uh, ANOVA. ANOVA is kind of a general purpose function in R. So depending on what you feed it, it does a few different things. But if you feed it two models and you tell it to use a chi-squared test, it will do the same test for you as, as the one just above. So again, we've got exactly the same p-value out. So the, the essence with... Um, these models is if you haven't got an absolute value like an R squared or uh, an AUC, which we have got AUCs with this this type of model, you can compare a relative value between the two models to see which one's better than the other by using the AIC or a likelihood ratio test. Right. The last thing here, I'm also using the model metrics package uh, to use the AUC, so the area under the curve, which is what I was saying about before, which is equivalent to an R squared here. So um, if I was to run that on that particular model, that then gives me a, a 0.7 or a 70% of the variation is explained by the model. Okay, importantly, again, because we're getting close on time, I want to make sure I just touch on, on the, the final section for you and I'll leave you exercise five as, as a, a challenge to try and apply your new skills. Okay, so lastly, we've built a model. We've built a brilliant regression model that we're quite happy with. Uh, now we want to use that regression model to predict onto either new data or to predict out onto our current data so we could test our predictions against uh, what happened in real life. So if you're doing it on a, a GLM, as opposed to a, a, an LM, you need to tell it whether you wanted to predict on the link scale, so the transformed scale, or on the response scale, so the back on the original underlying scale. If you're using a linear model, you don't need to tell it that because it's already on the response scale. But what I'm doing here is I'm taking our MedPAR data set that we've just used, and I'm creating a column called PREDS for predictions. And then I'm using the predict function, 
and I'm giving it a model that I fitted. And I'm telling it that I want it to predict the type of response. Uh, and this last bit here is just a little bit more dplyr code that's taking the top five um, predicted values. So there's a whole bunch of ways you can use prediction values depending on what your type of model is. But this one here is about the prediction of, of the number of deaths in a model, right? So I've said, give me the top five patients based on their predicted probability of death. So these are the patients who are most likely to die from our model. So um, predicting back out and scoring the risk of death out allows you to identify something like that from your model. So we would then know that from our data set, these uh, patients were the ones with the highest risks of death. I don't quite know why it's gone uh, that way round, but uh, it's got a little bit of dplyr. Dplyr changes so often. But what else? Uh, so let's see. Oh no! In fact, was that that was just the showing you the top five, wasn't it? It wasn't the top five ranked. Uh, then I've ranked them. Sorry, yes. So I've then arranged them in the descending probabilities. So we can't take the, the data out arranged it by the probability in a descending fashion and said give me the top 10. So these are the top 10 risk of death patients. So if you were doing something like a, a case finding model, so you're, you've been given um, a, a data set and you wanted to then apply this to your cohort of patient, let's say you're doing a population health thing, you want to apply it to your population and work out what, what region or area had the highest risk of death, you know you could do things like that. So how do we actually apply it then? Because that uh, that's where it hits the road, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you for coming. Uh, let me just move back over to our Studio Cloud when the menu gets out of the way. Oh gosh, Zoom can be challenging, can't it? Is there a keyboard shortcut to move between windows, anyone? There we go, it's cleared off now. Okay, so on exercise four here, what I'm doing is I'm picking up the Framingham data set again, and I'm creating, so this, this dollar is a, a an index for column name in a data frame. So we're saying create a new column, called preds and that column will be the predictions from our our linear models that we created earlier I'll, I'll need to go back and rerun that so I've got that this is where my naming things would really have helped if I'd have sticked to a naming convention right uh, let's go back over here. So I'm I'm using this on the, the linear model here. Uh, so I'm not having to specify that there is a response, but I'm feeding it some new data. So I'm feeding it back into the Framingham data frame. So predict has an argument called new data. So if you're going to build a model on last year's data and then you're going to feed it this month, uh, you want to give it the new data argument. And it has to have all the same column names that we used in your model. Uh, but you can functionally give it any new data set you want as long as the column names are the same. So that's now uh, predicted back onto Framingham, um, a column called Preds, which if I open that up and come along, you can see there, there is Preds. So if you remember the models on the Framingham data set about the predicted blood pressure. So now let's plot them and see how they compare with the original. So this uh, plot here is the blood pressure from the data set compared with the blood pressure predicted by our model. And it doesn't look too brilliant, does it? It's not very tight. Uh, it seems to be wider at this end, the variance, than it does at that end. But if you'll remember, that was because it wasn't a very good model. So if we pull up the summary LM6 again, Yes, our R squared was only 23%, right? So it wasn't ex explaining a huge amount of the variance there. But let's try the same thing for our, our GLM, our logistic regression model. So again, for the length of stay model, 
I'm now using predict and we're predicting out, but I needed to add that additional argument where we added the type for the response. So this tells it to predict on the scale of the probability that we want and the, the probability of death rather than on any uh, transformed kind of log odds thing because that was confusing to humans. So again, I'm going to do the same thing here, try and visualize it. But the problem with visualizing this thing is that death can only be zero or one, right? So that doesn't make a lot of sense. So how else could we visualize that? Well, we have to try and look at the distributions. So we can use a box plot for something like this. So let's explain the difference here. So we've got one box plot here for the patients who died, so one plot here for the patients who died and one plot for the patients who'd survived. And if you know box plots at all, this is the um, median line and these are the quartile ranges here. So whilst we might not have uh, something that would constitute necessarily a statistically significant difference if you did a probability test, you can certainly see that the mean is higher, or sorry, the median is higher in those who died in terms of the predicted probability of death. So we're predicting higher probabilities of death for the patients who died which is kind of what you want your model to do, but it's a little bit more complicated to see than the simpler plot. Or you could do something like a violin plot, you know, if you like crazy looking plots, but it depends on whether or not that actually means anything to you or indeed histograms. Um, so again, it doesn't to me make a whole load, um, a whole load of sense, even with the typos there. Um, there are some pro high probabilities of death, but it's only for a few patients, which is probably a symptom of the data set in that there weren't as many deaths in the data set as there were survives. So what I'm going to do now, uh, we've got one or two people who are needing to leave. So I'm going to finish there for today uh, and say thank you so much for your time. Um, I know it's been a complicated uh, set of information today because we've been going through uh, a complicated statistical technique. Um, but if I leave you with a couple of summary points, so we looked at correlation. Correlation is a reasonably simple uh, directional thing that gives you a measure of the strength and association. Uh, we looked at regression, which gives us a lot more tools in terms of quantifying that relationship. And we looked at the idea of the intercept and the coefficients for the predictors. We used R squared to measure whether the model was any good when it was a linear model. And there's other equivalents for the generalized linear models like the C statistic or the AUC. Uh, we looked at how we could compare relative models with a likelihood test and the likes. We also looked at when we're using a generalized linear model, what we're doing is we're fitting a linear model, but through a transformation. So it allows us to do things like binary models or count models using a different family. And we also had a little look at interaction terms which are when two of our predictors might together exert a different effect in each other's presence. It's, in, it's important to consider interaction terms where there's a rational reason to have an interaction. Uh, so in our example, we had length of stay and age, but the combined effect of length of stay and age actually needed to be blunted slightly because it would have overestimated. Consider transforming your GLMs back if you build a GLM, because it's really hard to read them on the transform transformed scale. So we tried to transform them back from the odds ratios. And finally, we looked at the predicting element. So using the predict function, you can predict out of a model. So if it was a model for blood pressure, you'll get a predicted blood pressure. If it was a model for death, you'll get the probability of death or the risk of death. Um, oh, that's terrible formatting. But I'll leave you with um, an additional exercise if you fancy flexing your new regression skills. Um, exercise number five. Um, I will come out of the solutions there, or you can look at my solution for it, obviously. Exercise number five is, again, using Framingham, is saying, try and build the best regression model you can to predict the 10-year CHD risk. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop there. All the material is available on GitHub, um, and we will send an email round, and there's been a recording of today. Do drop me a message if you want any more information or I'll stick around to answer some questions now for a few minutes. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. And um, I'm sure everyone's really appreciative of the work you put in and your presentation and lots thanks. of really good skills and knowledge there. We also encourage people to go onto Slack channels as well. Sign up to Slack oh, yes. and post on there as well and be part of the community for NHSR. But thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure.
Just see if I can get a Slack link to drop in the chat for anyone. Thank you. That was really great. Um, really Thanks. Useful. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Um, when I've read things in the past, the, uh, Dean suggests you should take like a sample of your data and try yeah. and it, is that what you should do? Or can you just do it on like the full data set and then? Um, so you can, you can do both. Um, so I think um, a lot of classical statistics is based on the idea that you probably have a sample of your data because it was impractical to collect the whole data set. But nowadays, we certainly with like NHS hospital data, for example, you, you've got all the hospital data. So there isn't an awful lot of reason to, to not use it, you know? So uh, if you've got the data and you've got compute power, then, you know, I, I, would, I would plumb for using all of it. Um, there are some helpful statistical disciplines about understanding how to use samples and how to generalize them up to the population. But that's the statistics class we talked about, I guess, for another day. Um, you have a concept that's referred to as the standard error, which is um, about understanding, I guess, how, how how different your sample might be from the population you're trying to estimate, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a terrible description of it. But um, there's a whole there's a whole kind of toolkit for for generalizing up samples to to the potential effect on a population. But if you've got what is functionally a population, you know, like all the hospital data, for example, then yeah. use that. Yeah, don't be afraid to use more data if you've got it. Okay, great. Because I've thought about you know seen things saying like take twenty percent of your data as a sample, and I was like, well, do I just take uh, okay. the first yeah. twenty rows, or <laughs> do so, I just so start, yeah? That might it. be another thing as well. So you find in a lot of tutorials, I think particularly um, in recent years, the online tutorials for machine learning stuff or some of the coding things, they say things like split your data into 80 and 20% training and test and build your model yes, on the 80% yeah. and test on the 20%. Uh, that comes from uh, oh. like a generalizability thing. So um, again, it, it's, it's two different paradigms of the um, explanatory model and the um, prediction model. So in machine learning terms, they're usually just trying to predict. So what they're interested in is predicting on data it hasn't seen. So they will build a model on the 80% and they'll use the power of having the bigger 80% to build a good model, but then they'll test it on the 20% it's never seen to see whether or not it works. Um, so that does make sense. Um, and it's in machine learning literature, uh, one of the markers of a good model is that they tested their model on data that was never seen when they trained it. Okay. So um, if you if you are trying to do a prediction model that you want to generalize to other situations, then like an 80-20 split is good. But there are other ways to do it as well. So um, there's a thing that gets called um, cross-validation and another thing that's called bootstrapping, which is where you take samples of your data and you refit over and over and you average over those different samples and they do a very similar job. So um, it's about generalizability. So if you want to take that 20% that and hide it away while you train the model so you could test on some unseen data, then you know that's that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, okay. It just it just depends on your context. So when I was building mortality models on HES data, I would fit it to the whole data set and I would test it on that data set. But I wasn't trying to predict out into the future. I was only trying to risk adjust on my data set as well as possible. Okay, that makes sense. So if you just if you're not predicting, it's fine to use the whole data set. But if you yeah. want to, yeah, yeah. to predict, then it's best to test it. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. And Great. if you do need to to sort of double check for generalizability, you can use cross-validation or bootstrapping, which are similar things within your data set. So you can use the whole data set and then you can do these extra bells and whistles on top. Okay, that's great, thank you. No problem. Do you want to stop recording now, Chris? Oh yeah, thanks. Let me... Can I do it? Oh, I'm trying to get me to share my screen again.